Hello everyone, welcome back to the Historian's Craft. So, uh, let's jump right into this one. So one of the things we do on this channel is we tend to cover Imperial Japan and the history of modern Japan uh, more broadly, especially the Second World War. So, what I want to do here in this video is expand on a previous video I had made, oh, about a year ago, um, examining the war from the perspective of the Japanese. And I've done a few other videos on the topic, but here we'll be taking a more in-depth look. All right, so during World War II, both the Axis powers and the Allies had their own sets of propaganda, beliefs, terminology, etc. And like the British and the French and the Dutch and the Americans, uh, so the principal allies, although in the Pacific you also get Australia, all of these countries had their own metaphors, language, that they used to frame the conflict. The Japanese Empire was no different here, um, with the Japanese talking about their place quite often in the war within the context of this thing the Japanese called Shido Minzoku. Um, it gets translated as the leading race, the purest race, um, sometimes the master race, and through this lens, okay, the Japanese conducted their side of the war, the manner in which they evaluated the military capabilities of the Allies, um, specifically the Americans, and the manner in which they behaved toward their Asian allies and their Asian enemies, they were all filtered through this lens of Shido Minzoku, so that's what we'll be talking about in this video. Now, ultimately, the manner in which the Japanese came to these conclusions, um, this has a really long, really quite exciting history of its own, and while this intellectual history is not our concern in these videos, I think it would be useful just to briefly point out one thing about all of this. So, one of the ways of conceiving of Japanese history is as a pendulum. So as an island nation off the coast of East Asia, Japan is at once um, isolated from developments on the mainland and intimately connected. However, there were attempts to shut this off, or at least tone down, maybe uh, mitigate the influence of Chinese and Korean civilization throughout the course of Japanese history. So then part of what happens in the 1800s, okay, is that that pendulum, it's not swinging from Japan to East Asia, back to Japan, it swings in a different direction, okay? Because Japan becomes influenced by Western civilization, which is part of what drives the Japanese state um, to construct a colonial empire on European lines. However, that being said, um, indigenous Japanese influences also work through magic on the Second World War and the overall development of Japanese nationalism. So drawing on influences from Japanese societal structure and religion, um, we have notions of insiders and outsiders, purities and pollutants, um, and the sacredness of certain colors. All of these things combine to impact how the Japanese understood their place in the world and the purpose of the war being waged against the Allies, specifically against the Americans in the Pacific. Now, out of all of these influences, probably... Uh, the most important for comprehending the conduct of the war was the influence of scientific racism. So, as Japan constructed its own colonial empire um, in an attempt to raise itself from a fourth-rate country to a first-rate country on par with the West, and thus be able to really uh, renegotiate the infamous unequal treaties, they did so in the context of European new imperialism and colonialism, which utilized new academic disciplines um, like anthropology, like sociology, and like uh, history to an extent, okay, to help construct deeply prejudiced racist arguments in order to help justify the existence of those empires. So what that means then, okay, is that in Japan, the construction of their own colonial empire in Korea, um, in Northeast Asia, certainly, um, after World War I, certainly in the uh, Pacific when they seize German colonies. The construction of that empire takes place in the context of being told that they themselves were, uh, if not subhuman, okay, certainly racially inferior, and that this was verifiable uh, via pseudoscientific analysis of things like cranial measurement, bodily height, um, skin color, the shape of eyes, etc., all of which were both figuratively surface level, and in some cases really uh, quite literal as well. Now, 
in digesting all of this information, Japan was not only treated with scorn by the West, um, in instances like the famous, or infamous, rather, Gentleman's Agreement of 1907. This uh, informal understanding whereby Japan basically agrees not to allow any more immigration to the U.S., um, and the U.S. would not formally restrict Japanese immigration like they do with the Chinese and like they tried to do in the 1920s with people coming from like Italy and other places in southern Europe. And at the same time, Japan was impacted uh, by the success of settler colonialism by the Americans in Hawaii. The Japanese use European and American methods as a model basically to assert their own cultural and racial superiority um, over other peoples in their Asian empire. So what this means then uh, for the study of World War II through Japanese eyes is that we have to understand the following. Western racism, okay, especially in the context of empire, was built upon the dehumanization of non-Western people and that because Japan attempts to emulate the West in building their own empire, they become obsessed more than anybody else with repudiating this notion of subhumanness. So, how do you do this? Well, on the one hand, uh, the Japanese could dehumanize others in their own empire, and they did do this, but they could also attempt to elevate themselves, and to do that, they have to come to grips with this difficult, rather nasty question. Um, Japan modernized rapidly, so the Meiji Restoration happens in 1868, and... By 1912, Japan basically has a fully-fledged factory system. They have a colonial empire, um, certainly in Korea, and they have an industrial economy. The first Japanese rail line was, and don't quote me on this, I want to say it was built in like 1874. My point is that you could be born in like 1840, okay? And when the major restoration comes, you could be 28. Now, in those 28 years, um, you would basically see traditional Japanese life. Some stuff is changing, but there's traditional Japanese life. By 1912, when you are, what, 72? Um, Japan has totally changed. It's completely modernized, it's gone through this rapidly, um, so you have to deal with this difficult, nasty question. Is it possible to be both modern and Japanese? Indeed, um, you can't see it on the bookshelf over here, but um, W.G. Beasley, this giant in the field of Japanology, basically makes that the focus of one of his books. So that may sound, um, you know, rather odd to us today. After all, Japan is a thoroughly modern country. They are one of the uh, economic superpowers in the world. They are basically America's chief ally in the uh, East Asian sphere. But at the time, okay, this was something that intellectuals spent a lot of time on. There is a very good reason why if you study... Um, you know, this historiographical question of should Japan in, in World War II, should the imperial period be considered um, fascist along Italian or uh, German models? There's a reason a lot of Japanese intellectuals take certain ideas from fascism, but ultimately reject the whole notion because it's European. It's not Japanese. So when Japanese intellectuals, when they see things like fascism, uh, when they see European developments like socialism, certainly with the um, attempt to do this with the Russian Revolution, their view is, ah, well, social. We see this word. Um, this refers to the body politic of the Japanese. Um, and all of the silliness about a worker's paradise or some nonsense like that is just a European... Uh, well, it's just European nonsense. It really means social harmony with the Japanese nation. So they're taking ideas from Europe and they're trying to tweak them, strip them of their definitions, and totally redefine them, okay, in a Japanese context. So when you read about, like, Ikikita, um, you know, one of Japan's leading fascist thinkers or quasi-fascist thinkers, talking about socialism, he's not talking about European socialism, he's talking about social harmony built on a Japanese model, um, and for this he's lined up by the Japanese authorities and shot against a wall. So, as somebody who uh, tends to focus on World War II in the Pacific, I really, I don't think I've come across a better summary of all of this than John Dower when he says the following in his book, War Without Mercy, Race and Power in the Pacific War on page 205. 
This intense self-preoccupation ultimately led to the propagation of an elaborate mytho-history which emphasized the divine origins of the Japanese imperial line and the exceptional racial and cultural homogeneity of the Japanese people. For modern Japan, history played a role somewhat comparable to the sciences and social sciences in the West as a vehicle for affirming racial superiority and the essence of that superiority was, in the final analysis, moralistic. The Japanese declared themselves to be neither physically nor intellectually superior to others, but rather inherently more virtuous. Although this moral superiority was frequently expressed in set phrases extolling the supreme virtues of filial piety and loyalty as expressed under the influence of the divinely descended Japanese imperial line, these qualities themselves were meant to reflect an even more sublime virtue, purity. In countless ways, the Japanese presented themselves as being purer than others, a concept that carried both ancient religious connotations and complex contemporary ramifications. So then, what was the Japanese justification for attacking the Allies? Well, uh, the goal of Japan, and this is clear from documents like an investigation of global policy with Yamato Race's nucleus, uh, Yamato Race being the Japanese, and we'll talk about this later because this document has some other weird stuff in it. Um, other documents like Read This and the War is One, and an outline of information and propaganda policies for the war between Japan and the Anglo-American powers, okay, makes it clear that, at least initially, the Japanese were rising in self-defense not only of themselves, but of all of Asia, um, and of the entire world. The aim of World War II, the aim of this conflict, okay, was to be a holy war uh, waged in the name of the Showa Emperor, Hirohito, and it was to conduct something of an apocalyptic war, that this, okay, in a manner of speaking, this was like the end of days, which shows up a lot in um, Buddhist thinking, and, you know, Christian thinking as well, um, but primarily Buddhist, especially Nichiren Buddhism, which we'll talk about in different videos, um, and after this war was fought, okay, the Japanese would establish a new world order in which everybody would live in peace, in which all would live, this is the key thing, in their proper place as designated by their race. Now, the Japanese were, according to their thinking, the purest race of Asia, the purest race of the world, and although they think about, you know, their place in the world in these terms, one of those documents, an outline of information and propaganda policies of the war between Japan and the Anglo-American powers, okay, makes it exceedingly clear that this was not to be a war between races. Instead, this is a war between nations for the establishment of uh, permanent global peace. Now, domestic propaganda would be deployed during the war, calling for the full mobilization of the Japanese people in both material and spiritual resources, so a drive for total war. So, why was this not initially perceived as a race war, even though it eventually becomes one? Um, well, because if this was to be a race war between Asians and Europeans, um, well then, why was Japan allied with fascist Italy and Nazi Germany, two European powers? Now, these were certainly, um, you know, ideals, but while the Nazis idolized the Japanese as the quote-unquote Eastern Aryans, privately, many, including Hitler, looked at the Japanese as subhuman. And similarly, many Japanese ultra-nationalists actually appear to have held the Germans in a fairly uh, low regard, so much so that one recent book on the subject is titled Nazi Germany and Imperial Japan, The Hollow Diplomatic Alliance. And despite this, by the time World War II breaks out in 1939, um, racial prejudice against the Japanese by whites and racial prejudice against whites by the Japanese had been in existence for over 100 years. So despite official... Uh, you know, early propaganda attempts to downplay this, feelings like that, they just don't go away overnight. And as we'll see in the rest of these videos, um, those ideas do eventually become the guiding force of Japanese propaganda, presenting the war by 1942 as a holy war not to liberate the world, but to defend the world from pale-skinned demons, meaning, of course, the Europeans and the Americans. However, uh, we do get into some pretty complex cultural issues fairly quickly here. The Japanese Empire... It never actually does what you maybe would think it would do um, in the context of all this talk about skin color and racial hierarchy, etc., and develop, you know, from the fear of the yellow Asians that Westerners had 
a notion of yellow supremacy. Instead, um, actually for most of the existence of Japan as a culture, the color white has had a very particular religious connotation. It was the color of purity in Shinto, the native Japanese well, I would say religion, um, but someone argue maybe it's not organized enough to really call it a religion, so let's use the term belief set. Now, because of this, the Japanese actually embrace whiteness as a positive description of themselves when compared to other Asians who, maybe like some Chinese, uh, maybe they have a more yellow hue to their skin, or maybe like some South Indians, uh, they have a much darker skin tone. So, essentially, in developing their own empire, the Japanese take... Europe's model of racial hierarchy, okay, and then rather than making their own, they just tweak it and apply it to themselves. So a lot of Japanese propaganda, especially illustrations from the war, actually present themselves as looking like Europeans. So then if the Japanese and their enemies, the Europeans and the Americans, are both quote-unquote white, um, well then maybe color doesn't matter. You could make that argument, um, but it would actually be incorrect because the Japanese have another color they associate with themselves, the color red. In Japanese culture, both then and now, the color red has many positive connotations, and what matters for the context of World War II, okay, is the following. Many Japanese um, were Buddhists during the war, so from one point of view, the color of your skin didn't matter because... Since the historical Buddha was from India, many Japanese believed him to have had dark skin, um, and he achieved enlightenment, so the color of your skin really has nothing to do with any kind of superiority. And all of this nonsense and all of this silliness um, about race and skin color, it's just that. It's, it's nonsense. But from another perspective, okay, what does matter is the color of your soul. And the Japanese believed they had a red soul. It was the color of the sun and the color of blood, thus the color of life. So, this becomes a powerful ideological tool in the Japanese mind. And the Japanese uh, for Red Heart, Seikishin, if you just read the characters together, it means exactly that, Red Heart. But if you read the characters for Seikishin, there's two of them, if you read them literally, you get a different reading. You get the reading True Heart, Faithful Mind. So associating notions of a red soul with notions of a powerful spirit sincerity, uh, faithfulness, etc., and notion of shedding blood meant that, for many Japanese soldiers, to shed your blood for the good of your country, okay, was how you demonstrated your sincerity. So when we talk about things like uh, no-surrender policy and Japanese brutality during World War II, um, yeah, this is part of why. There is nobility and failure. And I would assume... Um, that at least some of you guys listening to this have probably listened to Dan Carlin's Hardcore History podcast. Specifically, um, Supernova in the East, which recently wrapped up. And one of the things he brings up, which I'm totally going to paraphrase here, uh, because it's a point that he summed up excellently, is that if you have a thousand soldiers coming at you, and they're armed with spears, and they don't care about casualties... Well, then at some point, bullets don't really matter, do they? So, then, when the Japanese say that they're going to launch a war uh, for the attainment of world peace, and they're the ones with red souls, the pure souls, and that only they can have them because only they are Japanese, only they share the divine connection with the imperial family in Amaterasu, the sun goddess, well, then we get back to this concept of place um, that defined the Japanese empire. They literally were Shido Minzoku, the leading race, because they were the ones with the red souls. So then, in the next video, what we're going to do, because this is basically an intro, uh, we're going to go a little more deeply into this whole idea and talk about individualistic versus group purity and where that fits into the Japanese view of the Second World War. So guys, I hope you enjoyed this one. I certainly hope you watched the whole thing. Um, if you did, awesome. So take care. And I will see you all next time.